Hello, everyone. Good morning to participants from the West Coast and good afternoon to the rest of you. Thank you for joining the West Coast Regional Panel. We have an exciting list of speakers today for our session who has taken away time from their busy schedule to share their insights with us. Let me introduce myself. My name is Renal Paramel. I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm the co-founder and senior partner of a firm called Strategy of Things. We call ourselves an innovation-focused firm. Uh, we largely do work in the space of Internet of Things and smart cities. We do a lot of IoT research work and we help cities and counties formulate smart city strategies and help them launch innovation labs. As an example, we help design, launch, and support operations of SMC labs for San Mateo County out here in California, which was one of the first few regional efforts in the Bay Area. SMC Labs intends to support uh, 20 plus departments within San Mateo County and 20 plus cities who might need help in innovation and smart city type of efforts. Prior to starting Strategy of Things, I was a vice president at Gartner, the research and consulting firm. And prior to that, I spent a number of years at Accenture and Deloitte working across a number of different industries. I'm very excited to be here moderating this panel and co-presenting some of the work that we did uh, at San Mateo County. Do we have uh, John Walton join us? Okay, if not, uh, I'm going to start, uh, I'm gonna invite uh, Dominic Papa to start uh, his first presentation. Let me give a quick uh, bio overview of Dominic. So Dom is the vice president of uh, Smart State Initiatives at the Arizona Commerce Authority. In this role, Dominic leverages expertise in emerging governance models and strategic partnerships to drive a broad portfolio of smart state projects. Prior to the ACA, Dominic was the executive director and co-founder of the Institute of Digital Progress, an innovation-driven smart city nonprofit. Uh, in 2019, Dominic founded the Greater Phoenix Smart Region Consortium, an applied research and implementation partnership that allows local governments, private industry, and academic research institutions to collaborate. The smart region includes 22 cities and towns, Arizona State University, Marisopa Community College District, Maricopa Association of Governments, the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, the Institute of Digital Progress, and the Arizona Commerce Authority. So Dominic, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks a lot, really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here uh, with everyone today. I apologize, uh, of course, today's the day they decided to do uh, road construction right outside my window. So hopefully the background <laughs> noise isn't, isn't too much. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this panel and kind of talk to you about the work that we've done um, setting up that smart region initiative that uh, he mentioned and, and described in, in the introduction. Um, but probably what I really wanted to just talk to about today was, was activating ecosystems. It's probably the number one question I get as I travel around the country talking to my you know, fellow uh, city um, colleagues is, is how were we able to really engage the ecosystem um, in Arizona, in the greater Phoenix region to, to build this, the, the connective uh, initiative. So I'm excited to talk to you today about how we've successfully implemented this public-private partnership that is purposely designed as a permanent sustainable structure to drive this kind of continuous ecosystem um, mobilization. And so if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, you know, when, when people think uh, of Arizona, they, they tend to think of the Wild West, desert towns full of cowboys, cacti, uh, and golf courses. Okay, well, you know, that's not totally false. We do have a lot of those, uh, but actually the greater Phoenix region itself is, this kind of thriving metropolis with a vibrant ecosystem. However, when, when it came to smart and intelligent cities, we just weren't able to really get and create that kind of sustainable impact um, that was possible with all we see in the smart city, smart region movement. So when we had a chance to step back and really look at why, we realized that there, there was a fundamental flaw um, with the strategy around our ecosystem mobilization. A everything was designed uh, around one-off, unconnected events or, or projects. And so we realized that this was because there was no common vision or no really shared goals that the ecosystem could really rally behind. And this is causing cities in our region to fall behind quickly when it came 
to smart cities. And we were just missing out on these massive economic development opportunities that we see a lot of our cities around the country really take advantage of, like San Francisco, Austin, Denver, and Dallas. They were they were gaining, you know, miles on us as we were only really scratching to get to create inches in impact. And so so not too long ago, we decided we need to figure out what we could do to enable ourselves to be competitive with those leading cities. And after talking to mayors, city managers, CIOs, and others, we realized that our competitive advantage was who we are. It was really our ecosystem. So here's just some numbers for, for those of you that might not be aware, but we're the fourth largest county in the country with a little over 4.5 million people. We, we have the fastest growing county, I think for the last three to four years. We have the fifth largest city in the country in, in the city of Phoenix. We've got the largest public research institution in the country in Arizona State University. We've got 22 jurisdictions from very large with the city of Phoenix to very small with I think the, the lowest one being under 2000, but they're all stand up right next to each other in one county. Uh, and so we thought to ourselves, what if we could get those cities to, to really think together, act together, innovate together, and then procure technology and infrastructure together? Could we build a smart region and outscale everyone else that was really focused on building smart cities? You know, scale would be our dif differentiator and collaboration would be that new competitive advantage. So as we started to, to describe this, this idea to our cities, believe it or not, they, they thought it was a great idea. And we actually got all the mayors to agree to the plan, which I know for you city folk uh, is almost impossible to, to understand. How could you get, you know, let a, one council, let alone 22 different mayors to all agree. Uh, but to them, really, two things were obvious. And what I really wanted to touch on in this presentation was those key drivers, right? What are those drivers that will enable you to, to really effectively engage your ecosystem? So for the cities, um, two things were obvious. The first was that these challenges like traffic congestion, homelessness, electrification, they don't start in one city and stop at its boundaries. These cities, these challenges, they, they cross jurisdictional boundaries and in order to solve them and provide a higher quality of service, we needed to work together. And second, they realized by coming together, they could leverage the massive economies of scale and the purchasing power of all 22 to reduce costs and actually make the technology affordable to deploy at scale. So really it was a win-win for all, for all involved. And so now at the same time we were working with the cities, we realized that we needed to get the university involved. And, and traditionally cities in the greater Phoenix had struggled to work with the university because it was just so massive. You know, as I mentioned, it's the largest research institution in, in the country. If it were a city, I think it's it would actually be the 11th largest city in, in Arizona. So cities struggled to understand who to go to in order to help them solve challenges. And so we went to the president and we pitched them on this idea of the smart region and the 22 cities coming together to collectively solve challenges. And that now that we did that, we needed the university to also come together to enable more efficient, more effective way for the cities to engage the university and its researchers. Believe it or not, a lot of universities actually in their charters, as you can see it's used charter here, uh, have in their charters um, the, the requirement to, to make a positive impact in the communities that they're located in. Uh, and so for the university, the smart region was it was a mechanism that enabled them to effectively execute on their charter. And so we came up with the idea of creating a center for smart cities and regions that would be the one pipeline in uh, for communication into the university that would enable the cities to really access all the innovation and talent that was going on in the university. So we were able to drive the, the university to become a come engaged as well. And so now that we had the cities together, the university organized together alongside the cities, we, we had a solid, solid foundation and that missing piece that was left was the, those corporate partners that you see here at the bottom left. You know, private partners had the deep technical expertise necessary to, to implement successfully the technology initiatives that we were looking to, to deploy. And honestly, the financial resources that could help support and sustain a long-term initiative. So we went to some of our leading industry partners that you see and they eagerly joined um, join the initiative as they were tired of pilots and this new framework really offered the opportunity for scale deployments. It, it also brought all 22 governments together around one table that would enable them to build the relationships that they so desperately were trying to, to build with, you know, their customers. Um, and so with the cities, the university and the industry partners all agreeing to the idea of creating a smart region, the connective was formed. And here's a key detail that I think really made what we're doing here in Greater Phoenix a success was that the connective um, was designed to be permanent and sustainable in, a, in an organization in and of itself that would drive the effort forward for 
and on behalf of all of the stakeholders involved. It would actually have full-time staff that would be charged with the execution and the follow-through. So in order to do this, we built a financial model where each stakeholder actually pays a membership fee, uh, and it differs depending on who the stakeholder is in order to support and sustain the operations of the connective over the long term. So with everyone paying a fee, it actually made it affordable for all parties and enable us with the mechanism to drive that continuous uh, ecosystem mobilization. So ultimately, you know, this model has proved very successful for us uh, in Greater Phoenix. We officially launched the connective in November of last year. And during that year, the, the connective continuously brought the stakeholders together on this regular basis over a series of workshops. And they created um, the regional key performance indicators and metrics for success that you see at the bottom right hand corner uh, of the screen. Um, and these were all agreed to by all parties and therefore they created this buy-in and commitment across the entire region. This really empowered us with the common vision and that shared goal that every organization in every city could work towards together. So, so it's very, you know, we've been very successful in the smart region and, and we thought to ourselves, well, there still seems to be something missing. We, we did a great job at coming together horizontally, but realized that we had not started to yet coordinate vertically. So we realized that the state was at one missing was one missing piece, one missing partner. So if you go to the next slide, um, we thought to ourselves, you know, how can we go from a smart region to a smart state? And what we realized is that um, what we we created was a very great horizontal platform with the cities. Cities tend to be the the Renaissance individuals, right? They're good at a lot of things, but not great at any one thing because they have so many different service delivery lines, right? They've got police, fire, water, trash you name it, they, they've got to spread themselves out across a, a multitude of service delivery lines. But we realized that the state, we were organized much, much differently. States are very vertically focused, right? They're, they're very subject matter experts. You've got the Department of Transportation, Department of Health, Department of Education, right? Really focused on driving in-depth uh, innovation within specific verticals. And so we started to think to ourselves, could we build a smart state by allowing the, the state to be very subject matter focused and, and, and then plug that innovation into the horizontal platform that were the cities? And, and believe it or not, um, we were actually doing it and we didn't even know it. So if you flip to the next slide, in 2018, the governor announced the launch of the Institute for Automated Mobility um, through an executive order. And the sole focus of this organization was to really drive the advancement and commercialization of autonomous vehicle technologies. Um, through a public-private partnership, which included all three universities, leading industry partners like Intel and State Farm and Exponent, and of course, state agencies. Um, and so what the goal of, if you go to the next slide, what we've started to build, the framework we've started to build in Arizona is just like the Institute for Automated Mobility is driving innovation within the future of mobility, and then it's plugging in to the, the regional platforms, we're starting to create this framework for what we're calling a smart state that is really driving coordinated um, innovation across all levels of government and starting to align the innovation and technology strategies, again, across all levels of government, university and industry partners um, in, in Arizona. And so we're really excited about this framework. And then we thought to ourselves, well, you know, one smart region in and of itself is not very useful. Uh, how could we maybe, you know, create a connected network of, of smart regions in Arizona? If you flip to the next slide, um, that's kind of what we're starting to establish now within Arizona. It's this idea of, you know, uh, for the technical people out there, which I'm not very technical, so you have to apologize if I butcher this, but uh, a network, right? It grows stronger, ex exponentially stronger with each node in the network that you add. And so um, the momentum that we created with Greater Phoenix Smart Region, there's actually a Southern Arizona Smart Region led by the Pima Association of Governments that has been created uh, down there. And, and now we're hoping to add a Northern Arizona Smart Region node to this network uh, and of course connect to all the smart region efforts that are going on all across the country uh, with again the state really driving the vertical uh, innovation across all regions um, in, in very specific verticals so you see i am there broadband and the aic which is kind of our um, entrepreneur and startup community so that's kind of the the framework i apologize i know in italian I, I tend to talk fast but that's the the governance framework that we are kind of working with and, and honestly um ideating a, a, as we go uh, and so you're looking at kind of what we're working with so i'm excited to learn from my other colleagues uh and, and learn from them and see how we might be able to adjust this model to, to really make a, a strong impact in, in arizona so really excited to be here and, and thanks again thank you dominic that was really interesting uh, audience folks um 
we'll we'll take questions in the end. So if you have questions as various speakers are presenting their slides, please feel free to post them on the Q&A side or on the chat window and we'll definitely address them. Um, so we, we have four uh, uh, speaker sessions. So Dominic was the first one. Uh, the next would be for John Walton. Um, so let me give you a quick introduction on John Walton. So John Walton is the Chief Information Officer for County of San Mateo. I've known John for a number of years, and I can certainly say that uh, John has a great eye for forward-looking innovation ideas. Uh, John's passion to look beyond the basics of traditional government approaches to using technology is, uh, and, and his vision is to leverage county technology solutions into regional platforms that serve not only county employees, but also residents, businesses, and other agencies regionally. Aside from tech, uh, John is passionate about ocean time with his sons and racing cars. Uh, John is going to share with us San Mateo County's regional initiatives, starting with the Digital Divide Project. And along with him, I'll share some insights on SMC Labs that I spoke to you about before that John and I have been working for the past few years. So over to you, John. Thanks, Renal. Uh, sorry, everyone, for being late. Like most CIOs, I always experience technical difficulties uh, right as I'm trying to do something. So uh, I finally got on there. My computer decided it wanted to reboot itself at 11 o'clock. So thanks for your patience. Yeah, excited to be here with everyone. Uh, this is a great event and really appreciate being part of this panel. As Renal said, this is really one of my passions uh, about what we can do to better connect with the community and serve the community um, in a way through what we're doing with SMC Public Wi-Fi and SMC Labs. So if we go to the first slide, uh, I'd just like to talk about, you know, what everybody probably already knows, but just reiterate what we see in our county. And for those of you that aren't familiar with my county, it's, it's the county in between San Francisco and San Jose out here in California in the Bay Area. But what we find is even though we're perceived as being a, a very wealthy per capita county, we still have a lot of digital divide challenges. Uh, the, the availability of broadband in our community is at a very macro level and is really not correct for what people can afford or have available to them. Uh, with COVID, uh, it has really exacerbated a lot of the economic challenges and, you know, really highlighted the fact that most of government or the majority of the critical government services have really shifted to being an online experience. And so we really need to take that in mind when it comes to digital divide and think about digital equity and what that means when we serve the public. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, we've been doing um, public Wi-Fi here for a while in San Mateo County. You know, we're a very large county and um, it would be very difficult to cover the entire county with Wi-Fi. Uh, we can't even cover the entire county with cellular service. There's parts of our county, especially in that yellow area out towards the coast that you can't even get a cellular signal. So you can imagine what the challenge is like when it comes to public Wi-Fi. But I'm happy to say that, you know, six years ago when I joined the county, the board and county manager were very supportive of the fact that they knew there were underserved areas in the county that were lagging in accessibility. So we were slowly over time able to add, you know, 10 or 20 sites per year. And we really focused on um, sort of youth centers, homework centers, uh, public gathering places. We, we kind of saw public Wi-Fi as being a way to get people to come together in sort of a digital town square where they would come together in these public meeting spaces and parks and things to use the public Wi-Fi uh, system where there wasn't uh, maybe a good signal, especially out towards the coast, like I said, or, or areas where the economics were such that we felt like the, the people who lived in that area or spent time in that area didn't have the financial means to have unlimited or broadband accessibility. So it was very successful, uh, as you can see by the data, you know, we have over a million user hours per month on, on what I call the old now uh, public Wi-Fi system that's still operational and uh, is still being very well used. But if we go to the next slide, uh, COVID happened, right? Uh, so in February, uh, for us here, when we activated Emergency Operations Center and everyone had to shelter in place, a couple of things uh, that we had already known as sort of being challenges became critical issues for us as a county and a government where uh, when we expect everyone to go home uh, and shelter in place, then healthcare and telehealth become critical. 
Um, you know, distance learning needs exploded from being a, you know, take this laptop home and try to do your homework in the evening to uh, you have to have a laptop and it has to be connected. It's a Chromebook and you're going to do all your homework and be sitting there. Um, you know, people in mobility patterns change, you know, people are driving a lot less, but then the expectations that they could work from home, that they had good connectivity uh, grew. And so I think, you know, it went from a nice to have, or uh, if you can afford it, that's great. If not, you know, uh, go to the office or something. Overnight, it transformed into a critical utility that had to be in place. Otherwise, there was a, a portion of our population uh, that simply was not able to be at the same level when it came to all these things as everyone else. So if we go to the next slide. So what did we do? Um, you know, again, I'm very fortunate to work in a county where I think the executives in the county really understand and acknowledge and support these types of things. And, and it's an interesting county for me to work in because um, I've worked in two large cities before, uh, San Jose and San Francisco, and those are really self-contained in a sense. Um, you know, you own all of your own infrastructure. You have a, what you know, compared to a county, a fairly small footprint. Uh, when you're in a county, what I found was, you know, you have a lot of partners you have to partner with. So we have 23 school districts, we have 16 cities, we have a lot of uh, special districts, utility districts and things like that. But I'm happy to say, you know, uh, it, it's really a collaborative county, not just internally with the departments, but with our external partners. So uh, once we realized this COVID was not a, a month long or two month long issue that we were gonna get past quickly, uh, we were able to rally together uh, all of these various organizations and really start to look at this as a regional uh, challenge we needed to solve and make better for the population. Uh, a lot of the data that we got was from the school districts where they had good data on, on the students who did not have connectivity. And we saw the students not only as a need that we could highlight through a heat map, but we also saw those students as an indicator in those areas that if the students didn't have connectivity, it was probably a good indicator that that community as a whole, whether geographically or socioeconomically, also had those same challenges. So we, we used the students not only as a, a business challenge to solve, but as an indicator of where we needed to increase our efforts in, in the hotspot areas. So we, uh, we used CARES funding. Um, we are leveraging that right now. We're adding about 650 hotspots. So it's about a 6X increase over what we had before. Uh, going into this year, we um, we have about 70 new access points, which is doubling the wireless access points we had. Um, you know, we're hoping to uh, reach you know uh, thousands of residents uh, is our goal. If you look at the heat maps where people live, and we have some mobile units we purchased as well, so that if the needs move around, we can tow a unit into an area temporarily or for several months to address that uh, immediate need. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? You know, I think, you know, my story is probably similar to the stories like Arizona was telling and others, you know, this has been a real call to action. It's taken a program that um, was sort of a, a nice to have program in my department into a think a partnership program that we're now, you know, creating organizational structure with the cities, with the libraries, with the school districts, with the county to say, you know, even with what we're going to do with that uh, six or seven million dollars of care funding, we're probably still just scratching the surface. That's probably somewhere between five or 10 percent of the area we need to reach. I would estimate roughly that, you know, we probably need close to a hundred million dollars in our county to really significantly impact the digital divide challenges we have countywide. So we understand that there's going to be this ongoing capital cost as we continue to build this out and partner uh, between organizations. But then there's also going to be the ongoing operational needs. So as the capital needs are addressed, eventually it's going to turn into an operational challenge where we need to think about, uh, do we set up a new organization? Does one organization take the lead? How are we going to do this? And I think that's the journey a lot of uh, government agencies and, and cities and counties are going through right now. It's not just how to address the immediate problem. But what does this mean in the long run? What, how do we address this? How do we keep the momentum going? How do we preserve the progress we've made and continue that into the future? Over you. John. Thank you. Next slide. So John shared with you all 
the status and the approach we've taken for digital divide, um, I would like to share with you what we've been doing at San Mateo County with SMC Labs. Um, so a few years back, uh, I met John at uh, uh, a conference where John keeps frequently looking out for innovative ideas. And at the time we said, hey, um, there's a lot of activity happening in the smart city space. Uh, in San Mateo County, you have a lot of small and medium sized cities. How are they going to actually do all these things? And that's how we ended up with the idea of creating a smart region strategy for San Mateo County, both to help the various departments within San Mateo, as well as potentially become uh, a, a center of excellence for any city that would need help. So we started off thinking about what are some of the guiding principles for this initiative. And we said, hey, we need to do uh, engaging use cases that actually benefits a department or benefits a city. We need to start small and we need to learn quickly. We need to actually focus on uh, problems and outcomes, not necessarily go after a cool technology that's out there. We need to make sure that we're putting in reasonable small investments so we can spread it, spread it around multiple opportunities and that way we can have better rate of success. We want to establish true partnerships with vendors, not just someone who's trying to sell solutions to the county, but someone who's willing to work with the county to actually come up with a long-term strategic solution. And while we wanted to be strategic about some of these things, we also wanted to balance that with doing tactical things that we could actually see results for. And then our philosophy was, we shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel if something's already, already there. So those are some of the guiding principles behind uh, the smart region effort that San Mateo County approached. Next slide, please. So we used these guidelines and said, hey, let's, uh, let's think of how to build uh, a framework around this. So the framework that you see out here is what we started off to build out uh, SMC Labs. And uh, it's, it's got various horizontal layers, but at the very top, the red layers out there, those are the various channels of innovation that we see. So when you think about smart cities and smart region within a county, the channels of innovation is not just within a city. You have utility providers in your city, you have private corporations, you have communities like you know, airports, districts, office parks, and then you have uh, residences where you know, people may have cameras outside their house that could potentially be useful as a data for public safety, for example. So we said, hey, let's make sure we are looking at all the different channels of innovation and start one at a time and involve them. At the same time, on the right-hand side, you see here we have uh, listed about eight different outcomes. Any problem set or use cases that come in, into the lab, we wanted to make sure that it aligned well with one or multiple of these outcomes. So that way we can at least say that we are actually solving a real problem that can be measured through a concrete outcome. The various layers that you see below here, which we have community engagement, we have one for governance, policies, data, connectivity, they then just become support layers where we are ensuring that problem sets or innovations coming from these various channels can actually be realized. So this is the model that we, we use to kind of realize the lab. Next slide, please. So this is a, a conceptual diagram of how the lab actually works. So problem sets can come from county. It can come from various cities. The lab by itself will ideate around these problems, build some solutions, test it around. And we do that using a combination of our vendor network, subject matter experts and service providers. And the goal is once we get, uh, once we have tested out good solutions, then they can become deployable solutions either for a city or a county. And so the idea here was to de-risk some of the front end emerging types of opportunities that the county would be facing. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. So this is more to talk about. So what happens next? So these problem sets comes into the SMC labs and uh, you know we have a variety of these problems, but what do the SMC labs continue working on these? Our thinking was there are some areas where the lab would take the leadership role to come up with understanding how to solve the problem. And But once those problems are solved and measured, then we would hand them over to departments. So that's the model that we're going after. So some of the preliminary funding for trying out how to do these pilots and how to bring the right resources would be led by SMC labs. But once we feel that this is something that can be useful, then the thought process here is that departments would take them over and operational, the, operationalize them as needed. A good example of what we're doing right now is uh, we have an air quality sensor network that we have uh, deployed uh, about 12 of them all over San Mateo County. Before SMC labs, uh, we literally had one air quality sensor 
by the Bay Area Air Quality District that was not really a representative sampling of what the air quality level was. With this, uh, with these, with this network of 12 plus air quality sensors, we were quickly able to now determine uh, the micro environments across the county. So those are the kinds of initiatives that we're working on. We're really excited about what we have done so far for SMC Labs. And with uh, going forward, we are hoping to continue leveraging some of the le lessons learned from here and move forward. So that's all from us on this uh, on SMC Labs. Thank you very much. If any of you have any questions, John and I would be happy to answer them. I would now like to invite our next speaker. And our next speaker is Daniel Hugh. So uh, let me give you a quick background on Daniel. Uh, she's the Capital Program Manager at the Tahoe Transportation District, which is a bi-state special district responsible for providing transit and facilitating and implementing safe, environmentally positive multimodal transportation plans, programs, and projects for the Lake Tahoe Basin in California, Nevada. Prior to joining uh, Tahoe Transportation District, Daniel worked in private consulting through throughout California, Nevada as a senior project manager and hydrologist providing environmental services for projects and programs that span local and regional infrastructure improvements, general planning processes, site-specific development, ecosystem restoration. Daniel brings over 15 years of project management, stormwater, natural resource transportation, and land use planning. Daniel's interests include the integration of information communication technology, unmanned aerial systems, automation, AI and remote sensing to improve proficiencies in land management. Daniel, over to you. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, okay. So thanks for having me. Um, I think you can go ahead and go to the first slide um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Lake Tahoe. Um, so the Tahoe Basin and uh, the Tahoe Transportation District is under a bi-state uh, special uh, compact with a, a congressionally enacted compact that covers uh, basically the end of five counties and across two states, uh, California and Nevada. And so this brings a lot of challenges with it. Um, as you can see, you know, managing an area that is at the end of five counties also is uh, about 80% federal lands of the US Forest Service, another probably 10% um, owned by uh, both states. There's a significant amount of public lands within our jurisdiction and our boundaries and a lot of complex um, relationships across uh, the board that need to be, um, you know, people come to Lake Tahoe and they see it as one uh, system. So it takes a lot of coordination and, and efforts across these boundaries. Um, next slide. So we started off our uh, smart cities effort with really an analysis of cellular data back in 2016 uh, to develop a, a, a regional uh, corridor planning effort to look at how people were accessing the Tahoe Basin and to uh, really define the visitation that Lake Tahoe receives. Um, it was uh, an interesting study to really understand uh, where people were coming from. About 85% uh, you know, of our visitation comes from California and Nevada. And we have a significant, we found that we had a significant amount of day use coming to the region. Um, this, everybody, almost the majority of those people actually uh, visit by vehicle, by the private vehicle, and we have a very limited road network. Um, the compact actually does not allow for expansion of our road network. Uh, to, and so to the extent that we uh, develop transportation projects, it is a multimodal solution. So it is really about optimizing the system that we have in place. Um, and uh, so that's kind of where we, we started on this effort. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, really this visitation has led to a lot of challenges. Lake Tahoe is a, a very rural um, area that has extreme weather conditions. Commonly, we can have multiple avalanches uh, in a year, uh, you know, during a, a peak summer or a winter weekend when 
people are coming up uh, from the Bay Area to ski. We can have, uh, you know, a lot of people here, 4th of July, enjoying the wonderful lake that we have that, uh, you know, can have on average from that cellular data, data, 24 million visitors annually with a significant portion of those uh, people coming in the months of July and August during a, a high wildfire danger area. Um, we are not connected to the infrastructure, the um, broadband network of, late, of California and Nevada, Digital 395, which is uh, one of the bigger efforts that occurred in our region uh, stops down the hill from Lake Tahoe. Um, the system that wraps from Las Vegas to uh, LA, uh, San Francisco and back to Reno is uh, disconnected from us. And it's challenging here because of our environmental constraints, uh, granite bedrock, uh, fire danger and, and all of that. So the infrastructure is really limited here. Um, so, you know, we have uh, issues with parking. Uh, as you can see, uh, some of these slides here, uh, you know, we have a an issue with parking, people parking on the highway or in the highway, uh, walking on the roadway and really, so we're trying to manage that through technology such as parking management systems, mobile payment systems, linkages to our trail network and trail counters to understand uh, the, vi the visitation and the use along those systems. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, the question always it, you know, says, we know Tahoe's paradise, but we really question, is Tahoe paradise, such as those wildfires that have been happening and continue to happen this year? Uh, so because of that risk and because of that visitation, uh, our approach here has really been to try and partner with our emergency managers and really look at how we can um, bridge that interoperability across the various jurisdictions, the various agencies, and really understand how people are using Lake Tahoe so that if, in the event of a wildfire that we could actually um, manage the evacuations that would need to happen in that event. Next slide. So how are we doing this? Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we have limited broadband, so we really try and focus on what infrastructure we need to build out, what kind of partnerships we can do to do that. We run um, conduit in our bike trails. We are working to coordinate with other uh, utility projects, sewer uh, and water replacement to uh, run additional conduit, make sure that we're collaborating when we open up the limited roadway that we have. That's really, our, our road network really is our path for connectivity. Uh, and so that a partnership to understand what different uh, facilities we need to connect, where are our priorities, um, for laying that um, network are really, we're trying to map that out uh, well. We also, um, as I mentioned, are not really building new roads. <laughs> and so it's about making those linkages between these systems, utilizing that parking management data to really look at visitation turnover rates, how long people are where they, you know, where they are if they're accessing a beach um, and trying to help balance that demand across all of these different agencies' lands that they manage. Uh, we are currently launching a mobile payment system for our, park, our parking management program that we hope to expand regionally and work with um, our federal and state partners on their, with their uh, facilities as well. Um, challenges there is our communication network uh, we do, because of the topography, um, the lack of line of sight, um, there are challenges put with our wireless network up here. So trying to work to help facilitate uh, partnerships with uh, the, um, uh, all of the communication companies to help them uh, build that network as well. Um, we also are really, uh, you know, because we are a rural population, we have historically actually been on a downward trend in populations. Uh, currently, that's a different situation. Given COVID, we're seeing a significant increase in population 
and uh, people uh, registering in our local schools. Uh, we'll, you know, I think they're still trying to understand what that looks like in the long range planning efforts. But, you know, how do we start to better manage those uh, uses, provide that network for people that may be uh, working remotely, uh, people that want to visit because they can't longer, because they can work remotely, and really distribute that demand that comes to Lake Tahoe during those seasonal uh, periods. Uh, we lack funding because we are more uh, a rural area. Um, it is a highly visited area. It was proposed to be a national park many times over history and never quite made it there because of some of the development that had already occurred. So we're looking at ways uh, that to really fund the solutions and, you know, similar that, that uh, Park Tahoe, uh, that revenue stays to reinvest into the operations of the system as well as our maintenance. We're also looking at opportunities for uh, cordon and congestion-based pricing, given the demand that comes uh, by the drive up market to Lake Tahoe. Um, so, you know, the idea is to really help have this information create efficiencies, create, uh, you know, a funding solution and really operate and maintain the vision of the region to, uh, to help support our visitation and our communities that live here uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide. Um, so, you know, we've, <laughs> it's hard to do some of these things. We have, we developed these corridor strategies that uh, create these uh, and, and develop um, project charters and agreements on how to uh, have everybody come to the table, provide input on the needs, help to uh, adaptively manage these solutions based on a data-driven decision, and that is a shared data-driven decision. Uh, it, you know, we, we do this, and it actually helps to create more co competitive uh, grant opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of interest, especially in transportation for uh, value capture in uh, when you go to develop a large infrastructure uh, project, how will that continue to serve that community, whether it be through uh, a tax improvement district, a court and pricing system, uh, uh, parking management, or something along that, or, or broadband. Um, so we, um, it helps to facilitate a really strong um, uh, project and, and solutions going forward. We also, uh, you know, try to look at building off these pilot projects, uh, regularly kind of monitoring the outcomes. I think uh, looking at unique ways to utilize that data and share it with our partners. Um, this has really kind of driven some, some good momentum in interacting together, not necessarily uh, a single point of view, um, and it really helps to um, sustain our economy here, I think. Um, next slide. I, you know, we, as we kind of go, been going through this, you know, especially kind of looking at this uh, parking management system and the data that comes along with it, as well as this cordon system, uh, you know, it's really kind of, it's been interesting to look at the potential benefits that are there from this. And I think everybody, our communities, our um, emergency managers, our transportation agencies um, that are here and um, others are really seeing that, you know, coming together in this way helps to make uh, more data-driven decisions. Uh, when you're dealing with the flux and demand that we do here, uh, it's, it's really important to try and look at opportunities to um, distribute that demand and, and address that peak demand. Uh, it allows for us to optimize that infrastructure um, for all different types of use, uh, whether it be for our rec uh, people that want to recreate at our, our beautiful beaches or our businesses that need parking for access to their businesses. Um, these opportunities, uh, you know, have a huge uh, um, environmental uh, um, benefit. You know, it helps to encourage carpooling rates. It helps to 
uh, have people use our multimodal solutions like our bikeways and reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, if you do it through a cord and pricing system, really lets you target it from that source. Um, as I mentioned, the emergency response evacuation is an important piece, especially here in Lake Tahoe with all the visitation. And you know, we can really help to optimize the transportation system we have, getting people out of their cars is, you know, and to the, the place that they wanna go and enjoy and reducing that congestion and better managing that system and reducing those um, public safety impacts of people walking on the roadway and causing accidents. And uh, it, it's really, uh, I think an opportunity for us to come together and work on these solutions in an effective manner. Um, so, you know, that's really, that, next slide. That's really it. I think, you know, uh, one of our highway patrolmen has really, really said it well back in the, in, he's as, you know, these types of solutions is, uh, it goes from chaos of Lake Tahoe to a management solution and really allows for an opportunity for all of us to work together and uh, provide, you know, a unique opportunity that, that Lake Tahoe serves for, uh, you know, our country. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That was very informative and interesting. I know Tahoe is one of my favorite spots to go and I'm sure many who are attending the, attending the session would agree on that. So thank you for sharing that initiative with us. Uh, our last speakers uh, for the session is from Los Angeles. It's Jerry Power and Joyce Edston. Um, Jerry Power is the CEO of i3 Systems. He's one of the founders of uh, i3 Consortium, a community-driven nonprofit organization that enables community information networks by democratizing data networks. He's also the founder of i3 Systems, a company which develops technologies for real-time data networks that span organizational and geographical constraints. The i3 concept was created while Jerry was at the University of Southern California in partnership with many private companies and government agencies. Prior to USC, Jerry spent more than 30 years in the telecom industry where he helped apply new technologies that help shape the structure of the internet we have come to depend on. Joyce Edson has been a leader and technologist for the city of Los Angeles for the past 30 plus years. She's an accomplished and experienced manager with extensive experience in application infrastructure and new and emerging technology project management with using Agile and Lean Six Sigma. Joyce is currently the executive officer and deputy CIO with the city of LA's information technology agency. She provides city departments with application development and consultation for digital solutions. So over to you, Jerry and Joyce. Good afternoon and thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this. Um, next slide. The city of Los Angeles, looking at smart cities and smart communities, started out, of course, with the challenges that the city has. We are a very large um, organization, over 4 million residents, and with this next census, we're anticipating that that number will go up. Um, over 469 square miles, so geographically, we are very large, very expansive. In a given year, we have anywhere uh, close to and exceeding 48 million tourists. Of course, this year is probably going to be lower because of COVID, but usually it's 48 million tourists. And we have over 500,000 businesses in the city. We have a huge infrastructure and we need to maintain that infrastructure. But technology tells us that we have to do more. We have to connect that and we have to provide better and faster services to, to our public and the visitors that come here. So when we start looking at that, next slide, we start looking and finding the same kind of issues and solutions that you all are finding only in varying, uh, varying ways. So when I listen to all of the other presentations, I'm really struck by how many similarities there are between the different approaches. Um, We've all found that our cities, our counties have our own jurisdictions and our boundaries, but they're very virtual. If a person comes to Los Angeles, they honestly don't know if they're in the city of Los Angeles, uh, the city of Long Beach, the city of Santa Monica, 
uh, they may know that they're in the county of Los Angeles or they may actually be in uh, Ventura, Riverside. All they know is that this is quote unquote Los Angeles. And the services that they expect, they expect them to transfer with them no matter where they are. So that means cities need to be able to work together. Counties need to be able to work together. And it's the differences in the, in the approaches that I've seen today are really based off of how those uh, jurisdictions are structured and how they choose to interact with each other. For Los Angeles, this is the way we have chosen. Um, next slide. What we've come up with is the need to be able to leverage everybody else's infrastructure and investments. So one of the things that is a challenge for Los Angeles, like in Lake Tahoe, is parking. We are a very car-centric community, and I think even um, with the recent changes in how our socioeconomic system is running due to COVID and everything else, I think it'll probably be at least another generation before we give up our love for cars. So what we tried to leverage, and this is a, uh, an application called Find Me a Spot that is currently running off of the i3 platform is the ability to leverage uh, government, uh, doesn't matter what government, and private investments in IoT technology. What this system does is it gathers uh, digital input from parking, so smart parking lots, to tell us where there, uh, there are spaces available and where there are not spaces available. We also hooked in our digitized uh, street parking meters so that we could tell in a block if there was likely to be parking or not likely to be parking. So we used a simple algorithm if we had 10 parking meters and five of them were taken. Then we said, we, we uh, colored the block orange. So it was like a 50-50 chance. If there was less, more than 50%, then we gave it green because what we have found statistically is most of the traffic in an area is usually people searching for parking. So if you can go from door to your event, and know where you're going parking wise, you'll have less people circling the events and creating parking uh, traffic problems. What we did here though, is we leveraged not only the city parking, but we leveraged uh, individual parking lots. And we are reaching out through our tax and permit system to the parking lot owners to see if they would like to be uh, participate in this. Having access to this and being pushed out through this um, and this application should also increase their revenue. So more revenue for them, they're happier. More revenue for them means more city taxes, means we've created a infrastructure here and an ecosystem that feeds itself and allows itself to grow. Um, Jerry? <laughs> Go ahead, next slide. So um, when we started doing this, um, and this probably goes back maybe four or almost five years ago, um, we, we were looking at, at IoT and, and how do we take IoT systems and span them over the geography of Los Angeles. And, and because it's such a big city, what we found was quite quickly um, the operation maintenance costs of the devices when they break and repairing them and how do you, you know, somebody uh, somebody took a baseball bat to one of the devices, how do you go out and fix that? So, but those those operating costs go up pretty quickly in something in the air, like San, in uh, Los Angeles. Um, so that, that rules out some IoT applications if you want to make sure that you have a long-term plan to roll it out across the whole city, which is important because we sort of don't want to create sort of digital have and have not areas within the city. We're trying to sort of make sure we, we roll things out uh, across all the residents. Um, and because of that, we started thinking about, well, how do we get the costs down? How do we start thinking about doing these things? And we quickly came to the conclusion 
that if you continually look at um, IoT applications as sort of something that's driven by the application, then you'll sort of go out and you start getting the devices that are needed for the application. Um, and if that application makes sense, you got a positive ROI, you deploy it. But there's a lot of applications that when you start adding up the maintenance costs in the long run, they start to sort of begin to say, no, we should wait on that for a while. Um, and what we wanted to do is we sort of said, hey, let's look at this differently. Instead of thinking about data as a consumable by the application, we tried thinking about data as an asset. Um, Joyce mentioned as she was talking several times the word leverage. Um, if you start thinking about data as an asset, then every time that you can reuse data to support multiple applications, you've effectively brought the financial um, proven point, you made it a lot lower. It also, interestingly, um, by treating data as an asset, it actually makes it easier to start building applications because now instead of the applications trying to search for the data they need, build relationships to get the data, um, it, that's really a problematic and, and time consuming process, but by having it all together and saying, here's data as an asset, less treat, not, not think about just con connectivity across the internet as a utility, but let's think about data as a utility. It sort of starts changing the way you think about you do you do things and it really starts even shifting the way that you justify programs. And that's kind of what we wanted to get to. Um, we also wanted to do this in a way that it wasn't just thinking about the city or the cities as entities themselves, but we tried to think that about them as members of the community and we wanted to be able to build a data infrastructure that incorporated private data into the city data um, so that it, when you do that, you, the city doesn't have to go out and replicate a lot of the IoT and the smarts that have already been deployed privately. Um, so that sort of becomes this idea of like, well, we need to build an infrastructure to start going forward. Next slide. Now, as we started thinking about this, there, there were certainly things that had to be done locally. So, um, I mean, a lot of people talk about labs and, 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 and innovation centers, um, but we started thinking about this whole process as really being sort of a very layered process. Um, a number of the cities, they had um, business improvement districts that were going out and trying to do something in their business improvement district. Some cities had their local collab collaboratives where they were trying to figure out how to better utilize technology to improve the lives of the citizens. But we also have these regional collaboration efforts that sort of form around that where, where they take different cities and, and, and private groups as well, bring them together to sort of do something in the region. Um, SCAG is one of them um, in Los Angeles. There's, there's others, I3 Consortium is one of them, but there's also one around clean tech. Um, so there's sort of regional collaboration efforts. And um, as this program talks about what we're doing with NIST, it's sort of a, an example of how we're trying to take these ideas and, and expand on them and share them and learn from other people sort of at a national level. Um, and I guess even international, because a lot of international people do participate this as well. Next slide. So much like the collaborative process is layered, we started thinking about, all right, how do we start building an architecture that is layered where each layer is sort of managed. If you think about the way the internet was built, there are layers in the internet and layers are managed differently. We sort of were taking that same approach to thinking about how do we start building a data infrastructure that manages these data assets. Um, certainly there's device management and that's kind of a layer. How, how do you manage devices? There is the connectivity management. We talked earlier um, about Wi-Fi and fiber was mentioned several times during this session. Uh, but then on top of that, we, we put this idea of a data flow manager I3, which manages the flows of data so that you can steer data between clouds, between databases, between applications. You can steer and manage these flows of data as they go outside of the city entity, or as you start bringing data, you ingest data from external. So you sort of manage the flows, but you manage them independently of what's being done at the application in the database layer. So we started thinking about how do we do this as sort of a way to sort of operationalize and think long-term about how do we sustain the, the tools that we're building. Can we go to the next slide? So, 
in in the end, this is kind of the structure that we're, we're, we sort of begin to arrive to, is this idea where there's different departments, different residents, local enterprises, and all of these people own IoT devices. They, they sort of have the ability to either self-manage um, or connect them up, but they define what data is available out there. Um, it feeds into connectivity and we create these into data flows that are managed as an entity. On top of that, there's not a cloud, but there's a bunch of clouds um, so that the city can, can, the cities can pick between which clouds they want to put which applications on. They can decide which clouds they want to put the databases on. They can talk to each other at the application layer across the database, but it becomes really easy now sort of as new cloud technologies are created and evolved as you sort of start migrating keeping your data infrastructure relatively consistent to migrate into a new cloud system, or if a new application is there, um, if you want to change and go to a new database structure, um, all of that becomes kind of relatively easy to manage. That makes the whole thing very orchestrated as we evolve, because we know that we're not building to a fixed destination. This is what a smart city looks like but we're building to on a journey where a smart city begins to evolve over time. And even as the policies within the city change over time, we wanna be able to accommodate and make sure that the, the overall infrastructure stays and manages and is able to keep up with that evolutionary path. So that's kind of what we're trying to do um, here in, in the Los Angeles basin. Um, it's, it's been fun, um, it's been a good ride um, maybe um, I think that's we're still pretty close to on schedule. Um, uh, Macy, can you go ahead? Um, a couple of slides. Can you go one more. Is, is there one more after that? There we are. So um, I wanted to put this up there because all all of these all of these sessions that you heard from today they're really great sessions. Um, these are great great uh, groups that are inside GCTC. Um, if anyone's at all interested, before we go to questions, reach out to any of the individuals that are here um, and, and ask for more information. If you want to participate, I'm sure you're going to be welcome um, with open arms. With, with, with that, Renee, I'll give it back to you to sort of... Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Joyce. That was very interesting to hear what's going on in LA. So uh, uh, we have some time for some questions. Um, so attendees, uh, please feel free to um, add those questions to either the chat window or Q&A &A so uh, I can refer that to the appropriate panelists. Uh, while we wait for some of those questions, um, I had a question for Dom. Uh, Dom, you mentioned the, uh, the, the whole approach of uh, smart cities, smart regions, smart state. Um, can, you, can you give us uh, some insights on where you see the linkages are and the overlaps are when you go all the way from city, region, state from your perspective? Yeah, definitely. As I mentioned, um, you know, a, a lot of these, well, the state is very vertically oriented and, and would, let's say, let's take ADOT, our Arizona Department of Transportation, for example, you know, they would try to be leading a lot of autonomous vehicle or connected vehicle work on their freeways, but then a lot of those freeways would intersect with the local jurisdictions and at the same time you would have the regional planning organizations working on regional mobility planning uh, then you'd have the individual cities also working on you know unique individual last mile future mobility projects themselves and what was incredible is that they would all be spending the limited resources they had trying to usually test out or prove out the same technologies for the same outcomes and instead of actually kind of coordinating and combining resources and doing one project and sharing the data and sharing the insight, they would all be doing this individually in silos. And so what we realized is that um, by breaking down the barriers across jurisdictional boundaries, both vertically and horizontally, we we're actually able to drive a lot of efficiency, not only in internal processes, but also uh, resource um, capacity as well. It, it was really interesting. I think one of the first things we did out of the gate was we got the CIOs from surrounding cities together uh, and we actually were putting them through this kind of executive level education on smart cities um, provided by a Arizona State University. And at the end of the workshop, uh, the CIOs, you know, we asked them, how was the content? They said, oh, it was great. They said, but really the best thing about this was we all got to sit in the same room together for three days. We actually never get to, to see or interact 
with each other. And these were CIOs were cities that were right next to each other. And so we realized that, you know, some of the, the biggest impacts that we could make was figuring out a communication strategy to bring um, these people and these leaders together on a regular ongoing basis. Um, and so we're really developing now, what we're about to release is an internal innovation platform that allows the cities to input all of the projects they are working on, where every city can see what every city or state agency is working on, share best practices, share knowledge, share data. Uh, and it's kind of this internal uh, innovation tool for us. So a lot of the work we've been doing has been on kind of the internal structure and process. It's not the, the sexiest of, of things, right? Because it's, it's nothing kind of out in the public yet, um, but it's really helping us drive kind of the sustainable progress moving forward. Okay, fantastic. Uh, folks, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them. And uh, we have, uh, I think we have maybe five or six minutes to take maybe a couple more questions. Um, as we wait for some questions, I have a question for Jerry and Joyce. I know uh, Olympics is supposed to be coming into LA at some point in the future. And I know a lot of the planning activities you folks are doing are to kind of uh, gear up for that. Uh, anything you would like to share with us uh, from a, you know, either from a regional standpoint or from a city standpoint? Um, yeah, LA 2028 is a, a big kind of uh, thing that's always in our minds, always in the corner of everything that we do right now. Um, every time we talk to regional partners, the county and all the other cities, um, that's always part of what comes up in the conversation because even though the Olympics is being in Los Angeles and our mayor, bless his soul, um, had a very large part in bringing them to Los Angeles, the events are really going to be um, strewn all through from Ventura all the way through um, San Bernardino. And I think there's even a, an event in Riverside. So it's, it's a truly Southern California, Los Angeles region event. One of the things that we talked about with parking and the Find Me a Spot application was born out of that. That and the fact that I think every major uh, sports uh, all-star game and, and total event is supposed to happen between now and 2028 in Los Angeles. Um, so that is a, it's a good motivator for everybody to sit down and talk, but it, it's also an ability for us to sit down and talk with them about you know, we know you're going to do a, a, a you're, you're going to have video out there and you're using it for this, but I need to have video for something else. The data is the data. Can I use that? If I use that, it'll give me that much more and I don't have to pay for it. It's a, it's a added return of, of investment um, that can help make it more, um, uh, it'll pass more if through your funding sources. Right now, one of the things that we didn't talk about was we're looking at a project that'll take video feed from our sanitation trucks. Jerry will laugh because I wanted this off because we're not quite there yet with it, but um, we're, our sanitation trucks have video cameras on them for, on all four sides. And they did it for Cal OSHA reasons. But that video feed is video feed. We can use that feed to take a look at what's around the truck as it goes through because it's a, um, it's a facility in the city that hits every street in the city on a regular basis, uh, which is something that doesn't happen even with the police cars because they, they do hit the city, but they go randomly around. These are set routes, so we know that it'll hit the entire city. That video feed can be used for the sanitation purposes. It can also be used to use image recognition to see if somebody's dumped a bulky item. It can also be used, the back end camera has a great view of the street. It can be used to do image recognition on potholes so that we can then add AI algorithms to that to with weather and uh, traffic conditions and the uh, actual uh, whether it's concrete or asphalt, and we can predict when that should get scheduled for work. All of that coming off of one data feed, one investment on IoT data. Awesome. So Joyce, I, I got a quick question here while you were, you, you were asking me this. So how can other regions uh, um, 
share the learnings from the the platform model that you were taking uh, uh, you're, you're, you're taking an approach for right now what can other regions do to stay plugged into what you're doing and to potentially learn from that Jerry <laughs> Um, cer certainly, they can join the I3 Consortium. Um, we do put out a newsletter um, about some of the things that we're doing. Um, so there's there's that opportunity to do that. Um, probably the easiest thing to do is to send an email to either Joyce or myself, um, and we'll get you plugged in. Um, so that's pretty easy. Um, I, are there any other questions? Because I'd like to come back to something that I think is... Yeah, I've got one more question here. Uh, oh, how has the pandemic situation changed the regional initiatives focus strategy or priorities and I think there's an open question to all panelists so anyone can answer so so let me let me start and then everybody else can pile on after um, and, and I'll start with an observation um, and tie it back to your Olympics question um, one of the the path that we got to, although we talk, Joyce and I talk about here's where we're at, here's what we're doing, it wasn't a straightforward path. Like any innovation, you sort of take a step forward, discover something, another step forward. Um, so it, it takes time to get to this is this is what we should be doing. One of the things that started us down this path, though, was the Olympics um, and the realization that in 2028, we expect a lot of the Olympic situation is going to be characterized by IoT data. Now, the Olympics have events um, spread over all 88 cities in the county. And, well, maybe not some, some events, but people are going to be staying in hotels. There's going to be entertainment events. There's going to be stuff all over the place. So for the two weeks that the Olympics are here, all the cities in the county have to function like it's one integrated city and county to manage that data for that environment. If we were given the challenge of saying set that network up today, it'd probably take us two years to reconfigure all the data flows to make that kind of happen. You'd have a two week event and then another two years after that to get everything back to situation normal. And, and that really characterized and, and, and served to drive us for a lot of it. And although I'm talking the Olympics before then, we have a Super Bowl, we have a FIFA Cup, we have lots of other activities. Um, it was mentioned about wildfires. During emergency situations, wildfires don't pay attention to borders and being able to coordinate data across geographies becomes really important. If we would have been able to do that better um, around COVID data, managing where when what's going on, I think we would have been much better off and be able to better respond to, to the pandemic. Um, and I certainly would like to hear what the other panelists think about that. Sure, we have two minutes. So um, I'll, I'll ask Daniel and John both to quickly uh, chime in. Sure, I think ours has been really focused on some operational shifts and understanding uh, the changes in vis visitation patterns. We actually shut down briefly, but then reopened uh, and have had you know, some pretty high numbers of people here. So utilizing the parking management data to understand people uh, traveling you know, to our beaches, using it to understand, using that correlating with our uh, bike and ped data to understand how people are, are recreating because people are antsy, want to get out. Um, I think that's been main focus is definitely delayed, I think, some of the infrastructure investment discussions uh, because we've had to focus on near-term operational issues. Thank you. John? Yeah, you know, for us, the shift has been, um, it's not a 180 by any means. We're, we're still in SMC Labs, as Reynolds knows, you know, focused on innovation, kind of forward-looking out. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we have shifted a lot of our focus uh, to education and digital equity in our communities. You know, what we've realized is uh, this is an opportunity really to address some of those underlying needs of the community so that as we roll out new and innovative technologies, everyone um, can benefit from them. Uh, and so that's, I think that's our biggest focus right now. Thank you all. Uh, with this, I want to wrap up the session. I want to thank the panelists. Uh, thank you so much for presenting to all of us and uh, giving us your time. And to the organizers, Macy, Jean, uh, uh, Jerry, and everyone on the planning team, thank you very much for the session. I think it was very wonderful. Uh, I believe the, uh, the slides will be shared with those who are interested. 
And so that should not be an issue. And uh, have a wonderful rest of the session, guys. Thank you very much.